My presentation is called uh, Film Curating as uh, Montage. Uh, and I just wanted to um, put this, uh, make it quite clear that by uh, montage, um, montage is a term that's used in film for editing together two shots that have no apparent connection between them, uh, but create an idea or a further meaning out of the juxtaposition. And it's an idea that's particularly associated with um, Soviet filmmaking of the 1920s, Eisenstein and Berthoff and so on. So I've actually adopted this term, and it's going to come in and out of my uh, talk. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, a question, um, which I'm just speculating about <coughs> this. Uh, I don't have a very firm answer. But the question is a very obvious one. How did film programming become film curating? And this rather picks up your question there. How did this happen and what does it mean? Um, now, first of all, the most obvious answer to this is that the concept of, the, of curation emerged in the aftermath of what we could um, crudely call the digital revolution uh, when um, when uh, film uh, clunking away on its big reels in the back of the cinema with its projected light suddenly was transferred to these small magical little discs. Now, there were various implications of this that had a huge impact uh, on uh, film. First of all, this isn't what I want to talk about, uh, but I'll just mention it was the arrival of the moving image into the gallery what's uh, generally known in the cliché of how the black box invaded the white cube. And uh, there, the moving image is very high val uh, aesthetic and artistic values. It's very much curated, and it very much has the professional implications that I think Fiona was talking about. Trying to come back to that, to, to Fiona again in, uh, in in a moment, but it's very important to see this as part of the art world, um, and uh, existing as it were at the high end of uh, of um, this new kind of film uh, practice. Um, in dedicated spaces. Um, now, at the other end, uh, in a small phenomenon, which is only really just beginning to make itself felt, uh, is a much more informal uh, practice, which is what you could call uh, the pop-up, the new pop-up cinema, um, where, with the new possibilities of not so expensive uh, projectors, uh, the possibilities offered by streaming and by DVD, it's possible for, I don't know why I say young people, it could be old people <laughs> too, anyway, anyone to actually uh, get together either as a collective or as a kind of keen cinephile individual and um, curate their own conceptual version, their own sense of what how they want to produce film, and how they want their audiences to be uh, affected by this particular concept of uh, uh, film, whether it's aesthetic, whether it's history, or uh, whatever it might be. Um, and so this is, however old or young, it's a new generation of film curators working for small audiences and on a shoestring. So it, it really fits in with that kind of um, informality. Generally not in central London, generally in, uh, you know, in kind of um, deserted spaces that people have been able to take over for a bit, and always on the move, uh, not, necessarily, uh, um, not necessarily stable or fixed. Now, I just want to flash back. Um, I'm not sure if this is really allowed in the presentation. I'll try and do this very quickly. Um, because I just want to go back uh, and think about the problem of film curation. Um, film moved into the institutions, uh, into its institutions, really its legitimizing institutions, really in the 1930s, with the main examples being the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the British Film Institute here. And these institutions really fall into the kinds of definitions that we've had about being legitimized, uh, funded by the state, and used 
very much on the one hand in film context to get what had not been a legitimate form of medium or art into an institutionalized con I don't believe it. <laughs> into an institutionalized context. Uh, and, um, um, but there, again, uh, film poses a problem because you can't wander in and look at f film around the walls. You have to program it. So these were the great years of film uh, programming, and um, um, uh, which, in the context of these institutions, was really rather conventional and, uh, and uh, traditional. Um, generally around national cinemas, uh, prize directors, interesting genres, and so on. But these rather staid, even earnest approaches to programming um, were challenged radically uh, during the 1950s in, um, sorry, am I putting, uh, that's not part of my display. Um, <laughs> Challenged radically in the 1950s um, after the after the Second World War, War by Henri Langlois at the French Cinémathèque. Uh, and this was a period that reached the peak of its influence with uh, the new wave of cinephilia, which became the new wave of French cinema. So the people going to these screenings were Jean-Luc Godard, uh, Claude Chabrol. Jacques Rivette, François Truffaut, etc., etc., where they learnt cinema there and through Longlois. And this is where the concept of curating as montage uh, emerges. Longlois was completely disorganized and disordered. Um, but what he did was out of this disorder and apparently arbitrarily throwing films together, he created a dialogue or even a kind of dialectical relationship with very unexpected uh, movies, which started in that sense to talk to each other in an unexpected way, and then also say something unexpected to the spectator, to the audience. Longlois, in his od oddity, didn't just put two films together, he would put three films together, which is really rather a difficult concept. Um, but, uh, but, um, this is really where this idea of juxtaposition, unexpected but exciting, uh, emerged. And to my mind, it's out of the Longlois tradition that the contemporary, more conceptual, more informal practice of film curation has uh, grown. Now, I wanted to uh, end, and I hope I can kind of get this in. Uh, no, I don't think I will. I think I'll skip to the end. Uh, um, um, of just talking about two experiences that I've had uh, recently of uh, film, one which I think of as film programming and the other as film curation. The first was when I put together a number of films made in the late 1920s about flappers, the young modern girl, taken from all over the world, where the films together showed you as a historical document uh, how important this phenomenon was but also how international it was. The films were made in Shanghai, Sao Paulo, as well as Hollywood, London, Berlin, Paris, etc., etc. Uh, and the young women's gestures, clothes, aspirations, their relation to love, work, city life, all, as it were, spoke to each other and made a kind of uh, network and dialogue from film to film. The second one, which I hope I just have a chance to mention was an experiment I just did recently in the context of the MA in film curating, which has just started here at Birkbeck, when I put together um, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho uh, with Michelangelo Antonino's La Ventura. Both films came out in 1960. The films were made in very, very diverse circumstances, one a very typical art film, the other a very highly designed Hollywood film. Both had impacts on film exhibition. And I was showing them for obvious reasons, putting them together for obvious reasons, coming from these very, very different contexts. Both films, as you can probably, everybody knows Psycho, but not everybody knows La Ventura. 
But both films have two parts. And at the end of the first part, a young woman mysteriously disappears. Though in Psycho, we know she's been killed, but the mystery carries on. In the second part, the former boyfriend and um, sister, best friend of the lost girl, go off together on a search to try and find out what's happened to her. Now, these films, which seemed so different, actually started informing each other, talking to each other, and creating a terrain which I can only call, call uncanny masculinity. Obviously, Norman is one of our high examples of uncanny masculinity moved towards kind of the perverse psychotic killer. But putting this kind of strangely filmed terrain, I'm going to end in a, one minute, strange uh, 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 um, image of um, dysfunctional masculinity next to L'Aventura made the male um, protagonist of L'Aventura, Sandro, emerge also as a dysfunctional character. So his mysteriousness, his kind of art filminess, began to disappear as he moves through this strange terrain of Sicily, where men in huge numbers gather to stare at women. And episode after episode illustrates m the male dysfunctional attitude to sexuality to women. And finally, it begins to spread metonymically to the terrain of Sicily itself, as though, whether this is culturally fair or not, probably not in terms of the Sicilians, the whole terrain of Sicily begins to emerge as a kind of uncanny of the nation state of Italy.